Hello and welcome. Welcome to the channel. My name is Kuber. I'm a CICC licensed immigration consultant. Hey, did you like that intro? Because I somehow am, am already in the Christmassy spirit. I mean, obviously, because it's only about what, 15 or so days to go. And, and yeah, it, it's all in the air, right? Uh, and after this week's draw, I'm sure Christmas has come early for at least 5,900 of you out there. Uh, because hey, IRCC finally had that express entry draw, which we were really, 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 really hoping for for the last, what, six months now? And uh, it finally happened. Uh, other than that, there was not so Christmassy announcements that was also made this week about the postgraduate work permit extensions not being extended or postgraduate work permit not being extended any further. Uh, that announcement also came. Mixed mixed bag of of uh, updates uh, for this week, but hey, let's let's get started, and then we have so much more to talk about as to what's going to happen with this express entry. As in, uh, is it scary? Not scary? Things can happen. Things cannot happen. What's in store for four eighties, four nineties, four seventies, four sixties? We're going to talk about all that, and of course, so now that the postgraduate work permits are not being extended. <sighs> What are the options? What you should be doing? What about people who are preparing, planning to come to Canada? Should they come? Should they not come? Should they change their mind or everything else that goes with it? We'll be talking about all of this in today's episode of our weekly roundup. Uh, let's get started. Starting with the quote of the week, as we usually do, the biggest risk is not taking any risk. Duh. Uh, in a world that changes, uh, that's changing quickly, the only strategy that is guaranteed to fail is not taking risks. However, and this is Mark Zuckerberg, of course. Uh, he can say that, of course. Now Facebook is worth billions and billions of dollars, right? So, of course, he took the risk. He, he did what he had to do. Uh, but at the time when he was doing what he was doing, did he know this is what was going to happen, right? Of course not. There can be aspirations. There can be goals. There can be objectives. There can be plans. But you don't really know how it's going to look at the other, on the other side. But uh, you would also not know how it may have looked on the other side if you do not take that step at all. So not taking any risk by any means uh, is absolutely a recipe recipe for a failure because if you don't take a risk, it's not gonna happen. Uh, so you have to make the first step. Now, is Canada, is coming to Canada a risk or not a risk? Now, this is this is where it gets very, very interesting because it's, it's a motivational quote, of course, and, and we like these kind of quotes, but it also has to be relative to what we are talking about, right? Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Now, think about it. Uh, I, I'll take my example, right? Had I, I'm, I was, or rather I am, no, I am not, not I am. I was one of those people who never, ever wanted to come to Canada. Uh, I was extremely doing quite well in my career, in my occupation, uh, in my life. And for me, Canada was like a far, far, far away winter frozen land who nobody goes to, right? Uh, and I've, I've been to Canada a couple of times as a visitor. I visited and, and it didn't do anything to excite me to want it to come. However, as they say, never say never. And uh, things change, things happen. And, and things happened, of course, with me as well, not to my liking. And uh, uh, suddenly Canada was in the way. And then it was a, a choice to be made. Should we or should we not do Canada? And I think it was a it, it was an overnight decision. Like, let's sleep over it. Tomorrow morning, we'll take this call. So we decided, okay, Canada it is. I came to Canada on a visit visa, stayed put. I said, I am not leaving. I mean, I did not stay here illegally, of course, but I said, I'm not leaving. I'm going to make this work. I'm going to make this happen. So I had a couple of businesses. They all failed. I took up a couple of jobs after, uh, you know, uh, uh, after in contract with somebody who was not a company in Canada, but outside Canada. So I would work remotely with them. Did not work out. Tried so many different things. Did not work out. Worked as a delivery boy for a for, uh, a restaurant called Swiss Chalet, uh, worked as a delivery uh, boy for another courier company, uh, did all of these odd jobs, even worked as a cleaner. I wouldn't say cleaner, but actually a dishwasher in one of the... Uh, and doing all of this after having had such a cushy job, paying such amazing... I mean, absolutely, your motivation phew, takes a nosedive on certain days, but it was something like, I got to do this. I mean, uh, if, if I don't do this, then basically... Uh, what's going to happen in the sense like that resilience of of can i can i do this will i be able to do this uh, uh, it's like challenging yourself giving yourself a task and, and seeing if you are up to it uh, today i couldn't be more thankful i couldn't be more thankful i couldn't i 
and absolutely every single morning I, I it, it starts with that feeling of gratitude uh, and I, I couldn't be more thankful absolutely for all the blessings for all the abundance for all the for all the love for all the respect for all the, the career option that I have now I couldn't be thankful I, I wouldn't have had this had I not gone through that and said no I'm gonna stick around and I'm gonna do this so yeah absolutely works uh, but you will have to take that choice. You'll have to make that choice yourself. But let's get started with our weekly roundup before I start boring you with my uh, life history. Uh, stay up to date on Canadian immigration news and trends. Topics of discussion, as usual, PNPN updates, express entry, other news, of course, question and answers. Please, I can see tons and tons of questions coming through. Please hold your questions till we get to the question and answer section. Otherwise, we will just you know lose out on a lot of questions. Some good questions I can see. Uh, starting with the PNP draws. Ontario on the 2nd of December held three separate draws for candidates in the employer job offer stream. This was the foreign worker stream. Now, often, uh, whenever these kind of draws happen, especially from Ontario, people get very confused. People have heard about the human capital priorities stream. And most of you already know in the human capital priority stream, you don't need to do anything except having an active express entry profile. And of course, your primary knock code should be one that uh, Ontario is interested in or is wanting to invite skill trades, uh, healthcare, tech, uh, whatever that might be. So your primary knock code has to be that. So that's your human capital priorities. You don't have to do anything. You get invited if your CRS is within the range and your knock code is a primary knock code as in interest or as of interest to Ontario. But the expression of interest stream for Ontario is completely different. This is primarily, primarily not, not for everybody, but primarily is for people who are in Canada and have a job offer. Now, you don't need to be in Canada. That is not a requirement for all the streams. It is for some streams. Uh, in, in some streams, you even need to be in Ontario, not only in Canada. But the main criteria is you need to have a job offer from an employer uh, or you should have completed your master's or PhD from the designated institution in Ontario. Uh, only in these two conditions would you be able to create your expression of interest. So you have a job offer, you're an international student, uh, you have a job offer, uh, you're not an international student, you could be outside Canada as well, but you're inside Canada uh, and you have completed your master's or PhD. These are the these are the main streams under which you would create your expression of interest. When you create your expression of interest, it gives you points. And now for those points, they conduct draws in separate streams and that is when you get invited so on 2nd of december ontario held three separate draws for candidates in employers job offer stream now this was one of the largest draws that they've held they invited 1663 candidates in healthcare stem occupations and the minimum score was 43. they also held another draw in the skilled trades occupation again for employer job offer uh, stream and they invited 761 with a minimum score of only 34. Trust me, 34 is a good score to sort of get through with this one. Uh, and everybody who was invited, they now have 14 days, one four, 14 days to complete their application. One of the biggest requirements for this stream is that you need to provide from your employer an employer form. That employer form contains employer financial data, employee data, and some other information, which unfortunately most employers are unwilling to provide. Therefore, it makes this stream, this program, tad bit more difficult. Uh, but 14 days, if you have received it, your employer is on your side, then this is a good stream to apply for if you do not have any other options. But this is a non-express entry stream, which basically means you do not get any 600 points. Once you get the nomination, you have to apply through the non-express entry stream, which can take 18 to 20, 24 months in some cases. Uh, they also, Ontario also conducted a 13 candidate economic mobility pathway project draw. Uh, no minimum score was required. This EMPP pathway is primarily for skilled refugees and other displaced people who can then, who have, who can now immigrate to Canada and obviously get nominated by the province as well. British Columbia on December 5th held four targeted draws for 193 skilled workers and international graduates. Uh, international postgraduate stream does not need a job offer. Everybody else in British Columbia for any of their streams, any of their programs will need to have a job offer. Again, if you are a person who has managed to get a job in childhood educator, as a childhood educator or in healthcare occupations, then you obviously by now know that British Columbia conducts their draws almost every week and the scores are quite, quite low, which is only at 16 most cases. 
Manitoba on the 4th of December also conducted a draw. Uh, 117 candidates were invited, but this was primarily for people who were affected by the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, the minimum language benchmark was only CLB4. Uh, and for people who had already established a connection in Manitoba and uh, were able to score at least 60 points in the Manitoba criteria, they were all invited for this particular draw. Express entry, yay! Now this is where a uh, lot of things have happened this particular week. Uh, starting with the fact that the draw actually happened, right? Uh, after hiatus of 57 days, IRCC finally, thankfully, managed to resolve the technical glitch uh, because of which they were holding back the draws. 57 days, that's what it took them. Uh, 57 days and providing extensions to people who's, uh, who had received ITA in September 26, 27, 28. Those three dates, people who received ITAs, they were all given extensions. So after the hiatus of 70, 57 days, they conducted a draw. Whew, finally, right? But this draw, as much as it was an all-program draw conducted on the 26th, uh, 6th of December, not 26, 6th of December, 4,750 people were invited. 561 was the score. So the good thing was, yay, there was a draw. But the bad thing was, yeah, score was 561. Oh my God. I mean, you could, you could pull your hair out of your you know, head and, and say, what kind of a draw is for 561? But then if you look at the pool breakdown, uh, let me see if I can show you that. Yes, of course, I can show you that. Hold on. Uh, if I was to look at the pool breakdown, Look at the CRS score range. Between 601 to 1200, there was 4,525 people. So remember, I've been telling you this in all my live streams and other videos that uh, PNP draws is a mandatory requirement or a mandatory obligation that IRCC has towards the provinces because if they do not conduct those draws, then people have a deadline on their nomination. And of course, uh, the reason provinces are giving out nomination is because IRCC would conduct a draw. So therefore, what IRCC did is they issued 4,750 ITAs. It pretty much clears out only the PNP range, 601 to 1200. Primarily, by and large, majority are people who have uh, nominations, 600 points, right? There are, of course, a few who may be beyond, who, who may be more than 600, provided they have a 200 point CRS uh, LMIAs, uh, and you know those those people could be there, but not not too many there but primarily this was a, a draw for the pnp nomination so 4525 those got cleared okay and i'm sure by the time they have taken this pool breakdown which was on the 5th of december one day before the draw and by the time they conducted the uh, draw on the 6th of december there would be few more additions to the pnp number so this number between 600 and 1 to 1200 was probably close to 4600 4650 and after that they invited 4750 which basically means the number of people between the 501 to 600 range less i mean about 100 or some people got cleared therefore obviously i mean duh, the score had to be high five six i mean high 500s we all knew the score is going to be high 500s what we did not know is 561 that is one heck of a crazy high score but that's what happened 561 was the score uh all program draw the only thing we were happy about was at least the draw is conducted right i mean otherwise it's it's, it's a downer then the next day which was the 7th of december uh, as we were hoping again uh, i I actually, I'll be very honest with you. I was not expecting a French category draw because they had already conducted a French category draw even in October. Uh, I was thinking more in lines of healthcare, more in lines of you know STEM as well. But I, I didn't, I, to be very honest, didn't anticipate any other draw for that week because this was conducted uh, on the sixth. I said, okay, maybe they'll take it easy a bit. But again, seven December, thankfully, they did conduct a French uh, category based draw. Invited thousand people. 470 was the score, which basically again means another thousand people were cleared out from the express entry pool. All right. All these numbers are important because when we will start talking about the pool breakdown and analysis, then you will need to understand where and how these numbers are impacting. Then on the 8th of December, voila, I mean, this was a big one, right? Uh, STEM. I mean, I know 
in all my live streams that I've been conducting since the 6th of July, that was the last day when the STEM category draw happened or the last STEM category draw which happened, 7th of, 6th of July. Ever since that 6th of July day when the score was 486, but only 500 invitations issued for STEM category, whether it's my Instagram account, whether it's my Twitter account or whether it's your live stream. Every single time, the biggest question is, when is the STEM category draw? When is the STEM category draw? So, and we, we always knew that it's around the corner. We always knew it's going to happen. We always knew that there is one big STEM category draw happening or going to happen. Uh, finally, on the 8th of December, you had it. 5,900 invitations. 481 was the score. Thankfully, it was lower than the last 486. But again, we expected a higher score if the draw was to be conducted. Why? Because the previous uh, draw was at 561. Okay, so that tells you between 561 and 481, there were about 5,900 plus people who was in the STEM category. Now, mind you, this STEM category draw is not only for IT. This also has engineers. This also has architects. This also has certain other occupations, STEM science, for science, technology, engineering, mathematics, right? So they also have some other categories, other occupations that were included. 24 different occupations. So this makes for a big, big draw. 5,900 score is now at 481. Now, bear with me and, and we will talk about this more in detail when I get to this section. But this is a good draw. Uh, I know a lot of people are still not excited about this. They think, what is there to be excited? I mean, what do you expect? What are you thinking? IRCC is going to lay out a red carpet for everybody to come in through? No, right? So every time a draw happens, it is exciting. Why? It obviously is not going to be exciting for everybody, but it is very exciting for those 5,900 people. So yay, kudos to you guys, congratulations. And this is what patience does for you. You were, you were, you were persevering, right? You were patient, you waited, you waited, you waited. I know a lot of you are freaking out. Probably your IELTS is gonna expire. Probably your age is around the corner. Probably your work experience is about to expire on the past or on, on the back end. Uh, probably your work permits are expiring. Probably you need to leave Canada or God forbid you're being laid off and you have claimed 50 points for your job offer, so many different things are, are, are in the scenario here. But in all this, the fact that you get invited, that's a big one. Now we're gonna talk about the pipeline, this bottleneck that has been created, right? With so many people, so many people in the draw, who's getting invited. Uh, and of course, these, these, you see this 451 to 500 is now sitting at 60,000 people. So does 450s have a chance? Does 460s have a chance? Below 450 have a chance? We're going to talk about all of that when I get to that section, which is towards the end. So just bear with me till I get there. Now, what else happened with Express Entry? This is pretty much it. We, we, we already discussed 1,000 people got 470, uh, 5,900 got uh, 481, uh, and 4,750 got 561. So it was cheers all around. In other news, <laughs> this is where it is not very Christmassy anymore. This is the, this is the news which was... Uh, people were not hoping for, people were not praying for, people were not, uh, did not want to see. This is, this is the Grinch of Christmas, right? No more postgraduate work permit extensions. The problem here is expectation, right? When you start expecting and sometimes when the expectations are unrealistic. <clears throat> no, again, uh, thrash me if you want to, right? Uh, Hit me hard if you want to say whatever you want to say uh, and, and don't love me for it. But I've been saying this, if you've been watching videos, that the likelihood of another postgraduate work permit extension is, is not there. there. There isn't any. It's negligible. There was no likelihood. Of course, if it would have happened, we would have all rejoiced. But the chances of it happening, not happening. Right. And the reason for that is read the room, see the market sentiment, see what's happening in Canada right now. The cost of inflation, the housing crisis. Uh, liberals falling out of favor in terms of, of the general uh, public, by and large, there is a huge negative sentiment across Canada, right? Housing, inflation, uh, you know, the political crisis, the way things are happening uh, against the government and, of course, the anti-immigration scenario and, and sentiment as well. In all of this, there was no way uh, the liberals could have gone and, and done something of extending the postgraduate work permits. Uh, because had they done that, they are already being seen as a party who's not 
doing much for the Canadians to protect them, to protect their labor market, to protect their jobs, to protect their, uh, you know, to, to control the inflation and, and uh, housing crisis, to have a control on that. And with this, this they, they would have gotten beaten really bad over this. Now, what they did was, uh, so they basically said no more postgraduate work permit extensions. People who were eligible to apply for extensions until the 31st of December, that stays. So obviously, whoever is eligible, whoever's work permit is expiring until 31st of December, they are all eligible to apply for postgraduate work permit. Uh, if you are one of those who did not get the extension, then again, the point is, while it is fair to hope uh, for an expect uh, for an for an extension, the expectation that it should happen, it will happen, and then feeling uh, cheated, then feeling it's unfair, then feeling that you are wronged because it did not happen, that I don't think is the right way to look at it. Because by law, technically, postgraduate work permits cannot be extended. They should not be extended. Uh, you come to Canada, you study, you get one year, two year, three years, depending on your period of study, so that you can get the work exposure. And technically, if you read your SOP, that's what you're saying, I will go back, right? Uh, but we know that this is not how it works because Canada encourages, promotes the fact that if you have work experience in Canada, you have a better option. You have studied in Canada, you have a better option. So the problem is not with people expecting the, <clears throat> the postgraduate work permit extensions. The problem is the way Canada and all the parties, the, all the stakeholders who are involved, and I'm talking about the, 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 the educational institutes, the way they have packaged this whole program. So they are selling education which to be very honest is not the best in most cases uh, look at the top 50 colleges or look at the top 50 universities in the world where does canada stand maybe a handful two or three will will probably crop up uh, mcgill university of toronto university of british columbia i can't think of anything maybe university of ottawa probably in the top 200 right so when you have when you are not up there uh, but you're charging a top dollar, right? $20,000 on an average per year is the fee, average. Uh, but the quality is not really there. So what you're selling is not education. What you're selling is not a credential. What you're selling is, is not a qualification. What you're selling is a dream, a pathway to permanent residence. That is how this was being packaged. That is how it was being sold by all the agents out there who right now are pretty, pretty bummed up, right? With all this that has happened. Uh, in this scenario, what happens is that you start expecting uh, and feeling that this is your entitlement. Uh, unfortunately, it's not. It's a privilege. It's, it's given to you so that you can get some work exposure. So that if at all that you have the skill set and skill levels, then you can get, you know, uh, you can see a pathway. Another issue that, that I was looking at is that people waited until the end, right? So people's work permit is expiring in January, February, March, and they do not have an option. Why were you waiting until this last minute? I mean, it was as much, I mean, it was as if you absolutely were certain that you will get a, an extension. So if you are waiting right till the very end and, and expecting that you will get uh, the extension and now that you're not getting it, you can't blame Canada for it. Right. You, you have to blame the lack of research. You have to blame lack of planning. You have to blame uh, lack of effort of not having done enough to get your pathway through uh, postgraduate work permit extensions the way they have happened. Uh, trust me, listen, I am not I'm not against you. Don't get offended. And if you're getting offended, well, I cannot do much to, to soothe you or, or sympathize with you in this manner, because uh, you have to first separate the, the, the flag from the wheat. Uh, you have to sort of separate. Uh, and understand that there is a reality and then there is unrealistic expectation. So drop the unrealistic expectation, understand the reality. And now what are your options? Look at those. I'm going to talk to you about the options in just about a bit. But before we get to that, uh, understand that, and this is for people who are preparing and planning to come to Canada. Understand postgraduate work permit extensions, which was, which was happening earlier, is not going to happen. Uh, COVID was a big reason. COVID is long gone. Uh, that does not impact until and unless, God forbid, there is something of a similar nature, which is which is impacting in such a huge manner. We don't expect any more postgraduate work permit extension. So if you are preparing, planning and getting sold on to the idea by all your agents that you will get extra uh, extensions, etc., please do not buy into that. As of right now, if you are coming to Canada to study only because it leads to a permanent residence pathway, think 
think hard prepare plan research know your pathway know the journey for every single day that you are here in canada as an international student and only then make that decision because otherwise as hundreds and thousands of international students are very soon going to realize that all that money that they have spent all the tax dollars they have contributed to all the hours that they have worked very hard sweating in those sweatshops at that uh, at the low paying jobs it's not going to take them anywhere permanent residence is not going to happen i know some of you might get offended some of you might not like it some of you might even click off and and walk away which is absolutely fine because <laughs> it's if uh, if I'm not going to tell you that I don't know who's going to tell you, but but somebody's going to tell you, somebody's going to shake you up and tell you, listen, guys, you are still living a dream which is not going to turn into a reality because you haven't put in the enough effort. Because even now, I talk to so many people every day in terms of consultations, right? Booked out calendars. And yet people are asking me, my score is 470. My work permit is expiring in one month, two months, three months. What should I do? When we start breaking down, we realize they haven't maxed out their IELTS or their language skills scores. They can easily touch 500, but that is where the effort is not there. I mean, yes, I can understand that it might be difficult. The other option, what is the other option? You get an LMIA, which you and I know what the market is all about, or you find an employer who will support you, or you do another credential in terms of doing a master's, or you go back to your home country or you take up French as a second language. These are the only options. So what are you going to do? But you don't want to put in the effort, the time behind your IELTS or your self -tip. Take classes if you have to. Go for the language skills courses if you have to. Retake as many times as you have to. But probably that even 0.5 factor increase in your score is going to make a huge, huge, huge difference. I, I mean, I do not know what, how more, how much more politely I can tell you that you are being fooled into thinking that there is a unicorn that you will find, or there is a rainbow that is just waiting for you, sort of, you know, and for you to find a pot of the gold at the end of the rainbow. Uh, if you do not shake yourself up, wake yourself up, and get this done, uh, yeah, probably look for the cheaper one-way tickets back home because that is what it will resort to. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I, I got to say this because a lot of you who still call me, who still book consultations have a similar story. And when I see so many of you going through the same thing, then I sort of have to say this, right? Yeah. Sorry, but yeah. Moving on. IRCC to increase. Now, this is another one which happened. Mark Miller, uh, IRCC has decided to increase the cost of living requirement for study permit application. This was long, long, long due. Why was it long due? First of all, what did happen? What happened is that on the uh, 6th of December, 7th of December, uh, two days back, uh, IRCC, Mark Miller, finally came out because otherwise they only come out one day before the expiry of, of any policy or two days before the policy. But this time they came out way in advance and, and they made these few things or other made few clarifications. Five announcements were made. One, I've already told you, postgraduate work permits will not be extended. Second was that uh, for the new applications for study permit, the cost of living uh, factor that you need to take into account has been increased. All this while you require to show $10,000 uh, as living expenses for one person. So for two people, it was 14,000 for three for 17,000. So family of three was 17. Now the cost of living that you have to show is linked to LICO. LICO stands for low income cutoff. This is updated every year by ESDC based on the cost of uh, living and by, uh, and taking into account the inflation. This, I mean, for express entry, we all know you need LICO as well, right? You need, you need your proof of funds. And it is usually 50% of the LICO, only 50%. But for study permit applications, it has been made into 75%, which is more than what you need for, for your express entry as a federal skilled worker. So you can see where it is going. Now, I do not know whether this is coming from all those YouTubers who thought it was such a way to brag that, hey, I can get free food from the food bank. Listen, you don't need to spend money. Let's go and take uh, free food because, hey, let's, you know, uh, ransack the, the food banks and take all this free food, which probably we will waste most of it. Uh, but they made so many of those videos. I'm, I'm sure you've seen them. I mean, if you're not, you're on YouTube, go and search free food, free uh, food from inter for international students. You can see so many videos of these guys who made these videos. Then there was this press uh, coverage of international students who are sleeping on the streets uh, 
in a tent, tent because they couldn't find a house or they couldn't afford to, to, to rent a house. When all of these things kept cropping up and obviously the government getting a lot of bad press for it, what do you think was going to happen? Uh, they, they became more sensible as to ensuring that the students who come to Canada are able to demonstrate that not only are they going to be able to pay their uh, tuition fees, which as I said, on an average is $20,000 per year, but they should also have sufficient amount of funds available to them to manage their living expenses. 20,635, that is now the latest number for one person. For two people, it's about 24,000. For three people, it's about 27, 28,000 and it's so on and so forth. So if you're a family of three or four, the amount of funds required for living expenses for one year is going to be significant. And that's a big, big difference. And this takes effect from 1st January, not next year. I mean, not two years later, not six months later, but immediately. So all the applications that are going to be filed from 1st of January onwards for study permit, you must be able to show this much of money. Is it a fair? I mean, I, I would say it's fair because even 20,635, to be very honest, for a single person could be a far stretch in your affordability. Uh, this number of 10,000 was set in the year 2000. This is year 2023. 23 years later, if all they're asking is, is doubling the amount of uh, funds that you need to show, well, I, I wouldn't say it is unfair. The problem will be for all these agents who are sitting in India, in Pakistan, who manipulate the bank statements, who manipulate uh, all these funds, who loan you the money. And, and you know, these problems are going to happen on those ends. A lot of people will resort, all your agents, some of your agents are going to resort to providing fraudulent bank statements, uh, manufactured bank statements. That has already been identified as a big, big, big flag, red flag in a lot of the applications that are submitted by these agents in India, in Pakistan, and in some cases in the Middle East as well. So if you're resorting to those kind of people and then you get banned for misrepresentation, uh, forget about being refused, refuse is something else. Then you get banned for five years for misrepresentation, then you only have yourself to blame. But please do watch out, know the, know the requirements, understand the reasons why these requirements are being placed, put in place, and you will be so much better off. <sighs> this was the good part of the announcement, uh, rather the only good part, I would say. Yeah, this was the only good part. So Canada has decided to extend the public policy, which allows international students who are already in Canada or who have applied for the study permits as of the 7th of December, they can continue to work full time. So under the normal circumstances, international students can only work for 20 hours per week, which is fair to be very honest, because by managing your complete course load, uh, studying, uh, working for more than 20 hours makes it very, very difficult. I know a lot of you will, will always have an argument that, do you know how expensive cost of living is? Do you know how expensive tuitions are? Well, the argument that Canada has for that is that you are supposed to have that money. That is the reason your application is being approved. In your application, you have already demonstrated that you have enough money for your education. You have enough money for your living expenses. That is why your application is being approved. So for you to resort to that is not the way to look at this. The way to look at it is that while you are studying, you can work so that you can meet some of your expenses. You can probably gain exposure to the labor market. That's the that's the model. Okay, don't 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 draw your guns out at me and start shooting me down. I'm I'm not the enemy number one here. I'm not the state enemy. So don't don't do that to me. So I'm just trying to explain to you the model. This is the model. Now, if you are not fitting into the model, don't hold it against the country and the government. Understand the model and then you figure that out. But what, what has happened is in this point of time, last year they they announced this public policy that international students can work full time. So you work 30 hours, 40 hours, 50 hours, that's entirely up to you. But if you are working in a good college or a university doing a proper credential, it is very difficult for you to do a full time study and also work 40 hours a week. It, it's, it's very difficult. I know that. Why? Because my son, who's already a permanent resident, was studying in Conestoga College full time doing a logistics program. And he was also working full time and he was absolutely Naked. He was he was thrashed completely. I would see him probably once in a week for an hour or so, uh, and that's it. And he was completely, completely uh, exhausted, overwhelmed with this whole thing. And I saw that firsthand. So I can imagine how many of you out there are struggling with it. 
So what they've done is they've extended this 20 hour waiver. So you can work for more than 20 hours and this is extended until the end of the academic year, which is April. So while it is good news, it is not that good in news. You would, if you were expecting it to be extended for the whole year. So as of right now, if you are already in Canada, if you are already on a study permit, if you already have a study permit, or if you have applied for a study permit as of the 7th of December, then all of you can work full time until the end of April. There is no effective date. This is as of December 7th. If you have a study permit, if you have an application for study permit as of 7th of December, then you are eligible to work full time until the 30th of April 2024. That is the announcement. So I know a lot of you are quite relieved with this one. It gives you that much more time to continue working full time, probably meet with your expenses, probably prepare for your next year's tuition fee. Uh, but don't let your grades get affected. What Mark Miller has also said, and just before I finish this one off, uh, that even he feels, and I'm sure this is the operational think tank, the analysis think tank, which says that 40 hours is very difficult to manage. But what they are looking for is a permanent solution. Looking for it has not been implemented. It is being, it's a prospect uh, that they will look at instead of 20 hours, they will looking to make it 30 hours per week, which is as good as working full time. So the 20 hours is going to be increased to 30 hours, but this 40 hours is going to go away because that is unattainable for people who want to also study full time. So uh, on the horizon, <laughs> there is a possibility of this 20 hours per week become uh, 30 hours per week and that would help you understand it better i mean that will help you manage and meet your uh, expectations and your living expenses better okay so charges to changes to canada's inadmissibility fees which is starting from 1st of december which has already happened uh, so if you are filing an application for inadmissibility restoration so restoration authorization to return to canada rehabilitation all those fees has been increased so before you're making that kind of an application, and this is applicable to people who are applying for restoration of status. For example, if you if you have applied for postgraduate work permit, uh, you get the news after six months that your postgraduate work permit has expired. Uh, sorry, your postgraduate work permit has been refused. You are no longer in status. So now you have to ap apply for restoration of status. People who apply for spouse open work permits along with the postgraduate work permits do not provide proper documentation. Uh, their, post their open work permits get refused and they find themselves out of status. For all of you, who will now be applying for restoration of status, please pay the correct fee. Otherwise, your restoration application can also get rejected and you will find out three months, four months down the line, again, wasting a lot of your precious time. So please take note of the changes to the fee because as far as IRCC is concerned, if you do not pay the correct fee, then your application is not complete and they will cancel it and return it back to you. So please pay the correct fee. Now the restoration fee is $229.77. <sighs> Express entry pipeline. Now, this is one thing that we want to talk about. What does it mean? Uh, a lot of you out there obviously depend on the express entry as a process through which you can attain your goal for Canadian immigration. Fair enough. Uh, for people who don't know yet, express entry is not a program. Express entry is a system. It's like a CRM. It's like a file management system. And the file management system's name at, at this point of time with IRCC is GCMS, Global Case Management System. So Express entry is not a program. So people who tell you we will file under this program, the minute they say they are filing your application under Express entry program itself, then they are lying because they themselves do not know this. So the programs are CEC, Canadian Experience Class, Federal Skill Worker Class, Federal Skill Trade Category. These are the three programs in Express entry. The express entry pipeline at this point of time is looking like this. Uh, and this number is not accurate because this is as of the 5th of December. Uh, after that, there has been a draw where they have invited more about 11,000 people, right? Three draws, which, which you already know of. In those three draws, uh, where were those three draws? In those three draws, on the 6th of December, you had 4,750. Uh, on the 7th of December, you had 1,000 people for francophones. And on the... 8th of December, you had 5,900 who got invited. So overall, roughly 11,000 something. I didn't calculate the exact number. 601 to 1,200, 4,500 are cleared out. That, that we know, right? It's not rocket science. 501 to 600, you have 5,457 people sitting. And between uh, 491 to 500, you have 6,634 people sitting. 
481 to 490, 10,335. Now, similar analysis I had done earlier in February this year, and thankfully, immediately after that, what I was very happy to see was that there was a back-to-back -back draw of 7,000, 7,000, 7,000, three draws of 21,000 invitations issued in the month of March this year. <sighs> Fingers crossed. Uh, new year is a new year, and, and new year ref refreshes the quotas for the ITAs. Even today, a lot of you are misled into believing that the number of PR quotas is the number of ITAs. No, ITAs is not equal to the PR quotas. PR quotas is for the number of people. These are the number of people in the express entry pool. Now, these are also number of profiles. They will all be multiple people. For example, uh, you have an express entry profile, you and your family. So you have one partner, spouse, uh, two children. So you are a family of four. So that four people will go against the PR quota but only one ITA. So this is something which you should understand. Now, in this pool breakdown, uh, 4,500 is already cleared, as we already know. Out of the 5,457, about 501. And about 491, you have 6,634. In my opinion, only opinion, roughly three to 4,000 have been cleared out, not more. And the reason for that is the STEM category draw was at 481 which basically means out of this 10,335, a big chunk of people. And the reason why a big chunk is over there between 481 to 490 and not in 491 to 500, not in 501 to 600 is because those draws had been happening for a very long time. Throughout this year, there were several draws above 500. Throughout this year, there were several draws above 490. Throughout this year, there were several draws above 488, 489. Those were all cleared out. So whoever was on STEM was also cleared out. Uh, what did not happen was uh, 481. 481, the last draw was somewhere in the month of March last year, uh, this year. So after that, the draw did not happen. So those profiles continue to get collected. The uh, category-based draws have started since uh, mid of this year. So uh, all those have also gotten collected. STEM category draw, the first one which happened was on the 6th of July, score of 486. So again, the big chunk of the STEM category candidates was in 481 to 490. And I just explained to you why opinion, because there is no way and there is no uh, source to get the exact number. So it is all speculation. It is all assumption. It is all theory based understanding of what the numbers look like. So in my opinion, opinion only, please, you know, this is there is no way to sort of validate these numbers. In my opinion, from the score of 501 to 600 and from 491 to 500, which is a sitting a total of about 10,000, no, 6 plus 11, 12,000 people. Out of this 12,000, roughly 3,000, 3, 3 and a half thousand have been cleared out. Okay. And from 481 to 490, you could have seen about roughly uh, 2 to 3,000 have been cleared out. Again, in the next draw, we will have a better picture. With this understanding, you now know that the next draw, which I am hoping 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 really really hoping that we should have another draw in december probably next week and definitely a draw before this this year ends so i'm, I'm hoping for two draws you know christmas it's christmas it's christmas is just around the corner there's no harm in wishing and hoping so before the year ends before the christmas season before the, the the end of this year holidays i'm hoping that there are at least two draws if there are two draws i expect to see all the 500s being cleared out i expect to see the score touching probably the high 490s this year itself if there are two draws if there is only one more draw then probably you will see uh, another 500 ish uh, score uh, and going into january then you can see the 490s coming in so the number of draws will always make an impact how frequently the draws are happening that will also make an impact so if the draws happened this week if they are to conduct a draw next week why, why? if there's a precedence right it happened in march they did a back-to-back -back draws in a span of two weeks in a span of 14 days they conducted three draws and they invited twenty-one thousand people so there is a precedence they can do it the only thing i feel that they might be restricted with is the quotas of itas for this year in in connection to the PR quotas for this year. So uh, for this year and the next year, because obviously the ITAs that are being issued now have nothing to do with this year's PR quotas. They all have to do with next year's PR quotas. So this year's PR quotas is already done. It's already finished. I'm sure we are going to be seeing the high range of the PR quota being achieved for this year, uh, probably close to 500,000 if I'm not wrong. Uh, let's see how, how that goes on. So 
the people who are sitting at 490s. First of all, if you're at 490 and you are on tenter hooks, you are anxious, you are frustrated, you are, I, I do not know what is that, angsty. So don't be, uh, because in my opinion, and we're only talking opinions, right? In my opinion, you should be cleared out by February at most. I, I feel all the 490s, Again, a lot depends, you know, whatever I'm saying, a lot depends on how regularly they keep conducting the draws, how regularly they keep conducting the category-based draws. Uh, when the next year starts, they will have a fresh quota of about between 90,000 to 110,000 or 110,000 ITAs. I wouldn't say 110, I would say about 90 to 100,000 ITAs. So that 90 to 100,000 ITAs spread over 12 months, you're looking at roughly 8 to 10,000 ITAs per month, average, okay? With, with that, uh, if they have to take uh, a section of it for uh, French category, healthcare category, STEM category, you would still see roughly 60,000-ish being issued towards the regular express entry draw, 60, 65,000 towards the regular express entry draw, considering that they will continue with the STEM. But every time a STEM category draw happens, every time a healthcare draw, draw happens, every time a francophone draw happens, those also take away from the express entry pool those are also within the express entry pool so the regular express entry draws will only get help from these draws it's not like if the category based draws are happening the scores for the regular will remain high no because the pool is getting you know thinned by these numbers as well so overall overall uh, the draws at this point of time are looking prospective for all the four 500s there is no point of discussing right we know for a fact 500s will get played out 490s in my opinion you should all be cleared Feb. In worst case, in worst case, let's say we have another Grinch sitting in, in, in IRCC headquarters, right? Uh, and, and they are not very happy with the Christmas. So you might get extended into March. That's that's the worst that I'm looking at. But I would say definitely by February, every all 490 is getting cleared out. That's the, that's the way it looks like. 6,634 at 491, 5,457 at 501. I'm thinking about 3,000 less, so you have roughly 8,500-ish uh, profiles sitting above 491. Two draws, that's all it will take at most to clear these if, if you need to. So yeah, if I'm saying uh, that's the reason why I'm saying 490s, this is the logic behind that. 480s, now this is where uh, the, biggest, the biggest issue is, right? Because last year, we saw the draws going right down to 481. And that is because of the back-to-back. -back. Mind you, it was only because of back-to-back -back draws did you go to 481. Before that, there was already a gap. Last year, November also, there was a big gap uh, because the knock system changes happened. December, there was no draw last year because of that knock system. Technical glitches, IRCC couldn't conduct the draws. January, they started. They did back-to-back -back draws, 5,500, 5,500, 11,000 invitations were issued. Then in Feb, then in March, they came out and did these three back-to-back -back draws. So collectively, they managed to bring the scores down to 481 with high number of invitations. But after that, uh, they came back to the regular draws as in issuing 4,000, 3,000, 3,500 because it is not sustainable for them to keep conducting big, big, big draws all the time. So when they come back to the normal, then the pool gets replenished very quickly, right? Keep in mind, at this point of time, there are 900,000, 9 lakh international students in Canada. There are more than 1.2 million foreign workers in Canada. These are all getting points for education, Canadian education. They're all getting points for Canadian work experience. They're all getting job offers, a lot. And I don't know how many LMIAs, I don't have that number yet, but I think it is more than 100,000, 100, more than 100, 150,000 approximately got LMIAs this year, okay? Uh, in the last quarter, last four to five months, the number of LMIA applications have gone through the roof. Uh, so you can imagine all of them getting 50 points or 200 points. These are all above 480. These are all above 490. These are all above 500. So expect this to continue. So in my opinion, uh, 480s, I would not say 481 or 482, but I would say high 480s should also get cleared out March, April. Worst case, we are looking at pushing towards, you know, I'm not doing the next year ki bhavishyavani or I'm not doing an astrological chart reading. I'm just looking at the numbers and of course, hoping and praying that IRCC does continue with the draws that we are anticipating that there are no further holdbacks, there are no further gaps. So I'm going to restrict myself to only high 480s at this point of time because obviously future is very, very far. You can only look forward with the data uh, 
three months at most. So 490 is definitely getting cleared out. 480s, we will get into the 480s when we have cleared out 490s. Uh, at this point of time, there's no point. But the good thing is, because the STEM category draw has happened, and this is that should bring relief to a lot of you IT guys out there, uh, and a lot of healthcare guys out there also. So because the uh, STEM category draw has happened, and it's a 481, the next Ontario tech draw, uh, and I'm hoping maybe they'll conduct one this year, or maybe they will conduct one early next year. But whenever the next Ontario tech draw happens, now the high point for them is going to be at 480. And then the low point is going to be into 470s or 460s. So whenever this kind of a draw will happen, it will give them, it will give those people at 460s, you guys might have a chance with Ontario. 450s also, I would ex expect, because now that 481 cutoff has been set up for uh, STEM category, whenever the next STEM category draw happens, and I'm looking probably into early next year, whenever that happens, that will then set a base for the Ontario's human capital priorities tech draw as a high point. So for example, the next STEM category draw happens, let's say Feb, March, uh, with a score of, let's say, 470-ish, 460s, 470s. Then for Ontario Tech Draw, that will become the high point. Let's say the score is at 470, then Ontario will conduct a Tech Draw at 469 and then go below, depending on number of invitations they want to issue. So 450s, 460s, if you are in Tech, this is looking like a possibility because of the STEM category draw uh, that has just happened at 481 and hopefully going into next year as and how they conduct STEM category draws in the next year. So uh, IT guys, or for people who are still looking to get work experience, right now is the time. Get the work experience in the in any of the category-based draws for six months, and you might find your ticket to get to Canada. <sighs> this is the pipeline looking. This is how the pipeline is looking like at this point of time for express entry. Now, <clears throat> uh, very quickly, because we're already getting into the one hour mark, I'm going to talk very quickly about the people who are in Canada on postgraduate work permits and have no options or are not thinking what's going to happen. Well, first things first, if you are a Canadian experience class, class, you can still go back home to your home country and you will still be a Canadian experience class. You will, you will not lose points because you're no longer in Canada. A lot of people have this myth. A lot of people have this misconception that you will lose Canadian experience points if you leave Canada. It's not a problem. It's not a case. You can be a CEC even if you are outside Canada, as long as you have one year of work experience within the last three years. This is for Canadian experience class. Your work experience points for work experience in Canada will remain for the next 10 years. So all is not lost. For some of you, if you are really, really freaking out and you are thinking going back home is a bad idea, it may not actually be a bad idea. Let's say you have one year, two year of Canadian work experience. Let's say you do go back home. Let's say there is no other resort. Let's say you are not going to fall into the trap of buying any LMIAs and falling into all that unscrupulous activities. Let's say you decide to go back home. You go back home and you get your one year of foreign work experience. Hey, not only will you get more points because now you have three years of experience because now two years in Canada, one year outside. Not only will you get more points for three years of experience, but now you'll get extra skills transferability points because you have one year of foreign experience, two years of Canadian experience. Mind you, Canadian experience points do not vanish because you have left Canada. They will not vanish because it's more than three years. Just the class will change. You will then, if you have crossed three years, okay, and you still have Canadian work experience, it's just that you are no longer Canadian experience class. It means you need to show proof of funds. That's all. That's the only difference. But you will still have your points, 35 or 40 points for your Canadian work experience. So don't forget. Don't let that go. That's the first thing. So people who are freaking out that I have to go back to my home country, I will lose all this advantage. You're not losing no advantage. You still have the advantage. The only thing which might in the worst case happen is you have to show proof of funds. That's the first thing. Second, <clears throat> PNP options are still open, uh, provided you can find an employer. So this is where the research and planning comes into place. Had you been, while you were studying, had you found a part-time job with an employer and nurtured that relationship with that employer and probably worked towards uh, you know, uh, fostering that relationship. Now, at the time when you really need that support, that employer could have come true or rather would have absolutely helped you. But when you look for stopgap, you will do a minimum wages job anywhere in a factory, in a Tim Hortons, in a McDonald's, in a, excuse me, in a gas station, and then wanting to find an employer who is just going to give you a job offer. And once you get the PNP, you then scoot off. You see, the, the trust factor or the trust level of the employers, and I deal with so many employers, right? We, we, we handle so many LMIE applications. 
I think at the last count, we have more than 100 employers that we are working with at this point of time. Uh, we are catering to their uh, employment requirements. We're catering to the skilled worker requirements. We're handling the applications, the work permit, etc. One of the biggest grief or grievance that the employers have from these employees is that they are being used. So a lot of Atlantic provinces, the employers don't trust the employees anymore. Why? Because these employees just need to use these employers. So they will take their job offers. They will get their PNPs. And the day they get their uh, PR or something, they scoot off. Now, I can understand you wanting to, to pursue your ambition. But the very person who supports you, who got you through, if you are going to sort of, you know, go against the whole understanding that you tell them that I'm going to work with you, just give me the job offer. You get the job offer, you get your PR and then you leave. So the reason why the employer is willing to support you is because the employer feels or believes that you will support them in their business, in their operations, in their economics, in their, in their company's growth. But all you're interested in is getting your job offer and PR and then scooting off. Then these employers lose trust in any future employees who want to use the same thing. And therefore, most employers are hesitant. They're reluctant to help because they know they will get backstabbed. They know they will get they will get you know cheated in this kind of a system. So we are spoiling it for the future flow of candidates. Uh, I'm not saying continue to work with an abusive employer. I'm not saying continue to work with person who's trying to take away your rights or who's trying to cut short on your rights. I'm saying that if you have an employer who has been decent with you and who has given you and you have complied or rather you have promised to sort of stay around, then you know at least have that moral ethical obligation to at least work with them and, and complete your contract period so that anybody in future who is also resorting to something like that will have the opportunity. But I guess we are all selfish. We don't want to do that. And what we are facing as a brunt, you as an international students are facing as a brunt is because of whatever your predecessors have done and, and, and done with these employers. So don't really blame the employers every single time in the rural areas, in the Atlantic provinces, especially the employers are most upset with the international students because that is how they get treated. Now, PNP options are still there if you can find an employer. LMIE options are still there if you can find an employer. Uh, I am not promoting or telling you to go and buy an LMIE. I'm telling you to find again. This is about you having fostered a relationship with your employer. And that is where the research comes into play. This is where the planning comes into play. This is where you being smart from the get go and knowing where you're heading. That is where it comes into play. If you've done that, then by now your employer would be happy to help you get an LMIE so that you can continue to stay in Canada. So you can continue to work with that employer, help him grow his company. English language skills, people have still not maxed out. There are so many of you out there who are sitting at 450s, 460s, 470s, and you have the option of, of improving, increasing your scores, but you haven't done that because you haven't done it. Uh, either you are finding it as a struggle, you are finding it difficult, but then it will take some time. Probably you'll have to burn the midnight oil. Probably you'll have to work harder. Probably you have to take extra courses. Probably you'll have to spend more time on YouTube learning instead of watching those silly TikTok videos and scrolling those that rubbish. So, you know, it's it's choices, it's decisions. I, I, I'm sounding one of those cliched old dad kind of a thing, but I'm not trying to do that. It's your life. You've got to do what you got to do, right? I'm just telling you what you can do versus what you are doing. Uh, French as a second language is an option, but I don't think in the next two months, three months, you're able to going to be able to ace that. And this is again where the planning comes into place. Have you been aware of this? What you need to do? But as in its entirety, what you can always obviously look to do is fake extension. Now I'm not advocating fake extension because technically you shouldn't be filing one, but then law gives you this loophole. Law allows this to you. And this is, if you want to call it a loophole, if you wish to, in immigration law, if in Canadian immigration law, if you have a valid status in Canada and before its expiry, you file for an extension, file for a new one, uh, then you are on an implied status or a maintained status. In that maintained status or implied status, the conditions of your previous status continues until the decision is made. Because IRCC has got such severe backlogs and they're being so slow in processing the work permit applications that it's taking them three months, four months, five months, and in some cases, six months to process them. It basically gives you that much time on an implied status to continue working and figuring out what you need to do. Once you get the decision, which is going to be a refusal for sure, because you are not eligible to apply for an extension of work permit. Once that happens, uh, you will be out of status. At that point of time, you can choose to restore your status and apply for change of status to a visitor. By, I mean, by that, I mean applying for visitor record. 
again this is a common misconception common myth that applying for visitor status means applying for trv or applying for visit visa or having a visit visa gives you a status no having a trv or applying for trv does not give you a visitor status if you're already in canada you're already on a status once that status expires you do not automatically adopt a visitor status you have to apply for change of status which is also referred to as a visitor record uh, just because you have a TRV or just because you have applied for TRV does not give you a visitor status. Please note that because a lot of people have fallen into the trap of thinking like that and then realizing they're out of status and that they have no option to apply for restoration either. And hence, they have to leave. So these are the things as a postgraduate work permit who is getting expired, whose work permit is getting expired, what you can do. Uh, other than that, I wish you all the very best. Uh, I, I hope you have uh, you know, gained a lot. You've understood a lot. And I hope you are still able to find some options so that you can continue to stay in Canada and contribute. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being with me for this good part of one hour on your Saturday morning. If you're still here, please hit on that like button. Uh, subscribe to the channel. If Canada is on your mind to work, study, immigrate, visit, then obviously this is the only place I guess you need to be on. Uh, let's get on with the questions and there are tons of them uh, i'm obviously going to start with the super chats because i'm going to start with the super chats right <sighs> okay <clears throat> tijinder singh says 494 in express entry general category 1.5 year work permit left any hope i think there is plenty of hope as i explained in detail uh, by Feb, worst case, March, all 490s will get cleared out. I have PCC from India. Currently, I'm residing in Canada. After getting PCC, I haven't been to my home country. Is my PCC still valid? If I have completed six months of my PCC, insures and gotten ITA. So this is the thing with PCC. I know what IRCC website says. I know IRCC website says that if you have lived for six months or more in a row, etc., etc., only then you need the PCC. The thing is, IRCC has also been refusing tons and tons and tons of application if your entire duration of the stay is not covered in the PCC. So what I mean to say is that for any country that is not your country of residence. So if you're living in Canada, Canada is your country of residence. Even if you're a citizen of India, India is not your country of residence. Okay. So for any country that is not your country of residence, you should apply for PCC from outside that country. And that PCC will remain valid until your next visit to that country. Uh, even if you go for one day to that country, that PCC is no longer valid because it does not cover your entire duration of stay. Uh, now, you can argue with me, you can debate with me, you can quote me the IRCC website, which is all fine. I respect that and I understand that. Uh, just don't look for me when that application gets refused because we have seen tons of application getting refused when the entire duration of stay was not covered. So. Even if you go for one day, even if you go for one hour to that country, your PCC becomes invalid because it does not cover the entire duration of stay. So for your, uh, if your PCC was applied from outside that country and you haven't returned back, whether it is six months, one year, two years, five years, 10 years, then that PCC is valid. You can add a cover letter stating, I applied for this PCC while I was outside the country. I have received this PCC while I was outside the country. I have never returned back and therefore this PCC may be considered as valid. And that way you can submit your application. I have submitted countless and I this it's absolutely fine. Abhishek Bolar, thank you so much for the super sticker. Appreciate it, man. Uh, Manu, how to disclose home loan? I have six months settlement funds. Any letter of explanation needed? Two ways to do it. One, you can get a letter from your home loan finance company saying this is the current uh, outstanding. In addition to that, you can add a letter stating that your current liability or your current outstanding is this much amount against your home loan and then you provide a payment plan or you provide how do you plan to clear this outstanding or this liability without it impacting your proof of funds that is what IRCC is concerned about because IRCC is looking at for example your proof of funds to be 10,000 for example 10, it's not 10,000 but let's say you're showing proof of funds of $10,000 but you have a liability of $20,000 so this is negative right so you need to just let IRCC know how do you plan to clear your 20,000 liability so that it doesn't impact your 10,000. In your case, if you are a home loan, it's an asset covered loan. You can always say that you intend to dispose of your property. You don't have to, you have to say that. Uh, you can provide an affidavit, you can provide a payment plan, you can say that 
while my loan continues, I plan to pay off my salary. And once I am approved and I'm planning to come to Canada, I intend to dispose of my property, intend to sell off my property and clear this liability before I come to Canada. And therefore, it does not impact my proof of funds. I hope that clears. How does IRCC assess paid vacation time and work experience? For example, if I get four weeks of paid vacation annually, can I apply for PR on the day of my work anniversary or do I have to wait for four weeks? Well, IRCC website says that uh, the visa officers take a very holistic view on your paid work experience. Uh, they give you up to two weeks and they account for two weeks. Uh, will they give you four weeks? Now that will become the discretion. And in my opinion, in my experience, in all these years that I've been practicing, I don't like discretion bit. Because when you give somebody discretion, then they can go in your favor and they can go against you. So I would rather uh, wait for at least two weeks, get additional two weeks of work experience and then submit. That way I know two weeks will be covered because that is not discretionary. That is something which they do. Uh, an extra two weeks is already covered because, uh, you know, I already worked for extra two weeks. So that's what I would do. <laughs> I am currently on an open work permit. I worked for two remote software jobs at the same time. Do I need to show both since claiming points for only one? Do I need to provide explanation letter? Okay, good question. A uh, lot of people work for multiple jobs. Now, you can get points for multiple jobs as long as your total work period is 30 hours. So what I mean to say by that is that you work 15 hours per week in one job. You work 15 hours per week in another job, right? Two different uh, periods of work. Uh, you can claim points for both, combine them and say 30 hours per week full time. Or if you're working 30 hours in one company, 40 hours in another company or 30 hours and 30 hours or 30 hours or 20 hours. In that case, you can claim only for 30 hours. So the other 20 hours per week or 30 hours per week or 40, whatever is the other employment period for which you are not claiming points, that work experience does not need to be shown in work history. That will go in your personal history, but you must show it in your personal history. Okay. Uh, if you are working two jobs, that's fine. There is no problem. Claim for one, show it in your work history. Other work experience goes in your personal history and there is no documentation required for that. Hope that helps. Uh, Ruthwick says, I got an ITA yesterday. Congratulations. Technically, I finished my work experience on 16th of Jan 2024. What to do? Also changing my address from 1st Jan. So as far as changing your address is concerned, that is a, a, a no brainer. Just update your address when you're completing your application. And because you will complete your work experience on 16th of Jan, then on 17th, 18th, 19th of Jan, whenever you are comfortable, you submit your application. So you will, this is the problem with the express entry system, the, the GCMS system. It allocates you work experience points before you complete the 12 months. Why? Because it calculates month year. So the starting date is calculated as the month year and the ending date is calculated the first of that month and that particular year. So therefore, it gives you the points much earlier before you have completed your one year. So the, 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 the knack to do this is that continue with your application, but submit your application only after completing your one year of work experience. Now, this is not misrepresentation. And a lot of people think, oh, this is misrepresentation. The reason why this is not misrepresentation is because you did not tell the system that I have completed one year. All you're telling the system is your starting month. System asks you for your month. So you're saying, I started work in January of 2023. Uh, but the system chooses to give you the points earlier. You did not misinterpret it. You did not say, I have already completed one year. So system gives you the points in December because it is calculating from 1st of January to 31st of December or sorry, 1st of December. And by that, they are giving you the points already. Uh, but what you need to do is you need to submit your application only after completing your valid legal period of work for which you're claiming points. It's not a problem. Don't worry about it. I hope that helps. Uh, I am at 486, was planning to visit India for two months. If I get an ITA while in India, how do I proceed with PCC? Like, can I submit PCC from India? It will all depend as to what you choose as your country of residence at the time you are submitting your application. So in a situation when you are between two things, then I usually recommend you return back to Canada, apply for PCC from Canada for your India, because that would cover your entire duration of stay and then submit your application. Uh, but that's usually the way to do it. Prash says, how much of job duties on experience letter should match with the NOC code? I got invited in STEM and my experience matches around 50%. Now, this is another common question where people say, what is the percentage of knock match? There is no such thing as a percentage of knock match. IRCC does not say it should match 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%, 70%. They don't say that. 
what the law states is that the substantial number of your duties should match. Now, this term substantial can be very subjective. For some people, 50% can be substantial. For some people, 80% is substantial. So you need to look at the knock code <clears throat> and you need to look at your job description and ask a third person to read the two and say if they match. So the gist of what you do the, in, its, in its entirety, in its comprehensive manner, what you do should match in comprehensive manner with the job description that is indicated on the knock. Percentage, looking at exact point to point is not the way to do it. Understand it, uh, look at it in its entirety, look at it in its complete uh, job description and then see whether you do the same thing or not. And it's not only the knock duties, it is also the lead statement which you should look at. So both should match. Uh, my score right now is 485. My work permit is expiring August 24. Should I wait or look for LMIA? Job doesn't come under the category specific draw. Well, if I was in your place, I would start looking at options. I wouldn't wait. While in my opinion, I think 485 may have a chance uh, by second quarter of next year, if not earlier, probably, hopefully, hopefully first but looks a bit it all depends on ircc whether they will conduct those big large size draw whether they will conduct back-to-back -back draws how will they do it when they will do it that is where it puts you on a bit of a tenter hook uh, at this point of time you are in 480s where i would say there's a huge huge chunk of people who are waiting it's not as bad as last year so all ircc needs to do is conduct few back-to-back -back draws for it to very quickly come into 480s so i'm optimistic uh, but I would like to keep my options open. So for that reason alone, I would say at least have somebody who's willing to do it for you. Uh, and then if need be, probably by April, May, June, you can start engaging that person. But have the option, have it available, but you may not have, to, you might not need it. Uh, no question there, no question there. Okay. Do I need same person after event just for a missing letter in my educational certificate? Also, if I split a name into first name and last name, but same name. Uh, no, in my opinion, you don't need a same name affidavit for this one. You can just add a letter of explanation and explain the one alphabet missing issue there. Uh, seeking TRV for family reunification, but lack official employment documents due to family business. No bank deposit for salary, PR, application underway from India, spouse in Canada completed biometric and medical so spouse is in canada pr application underway from india so who do you need trv for if your spouse is already in canada maybe i'm not able to understand this question so okay let, forget the, the confusion so you are applying for trv one of the reasons of tr one of the ways of applying for trv is for you to be able to show ties to home country, even if you're applying under the family reunification, even if you have the file number for your spousal sponsorship application, even if you're providing that, you still need to show ties to your home country. Without the ties to your home country, then your application still has a possibility of being refused. Now, the visit visas or the TRVs under the family reunification have a good chance of approval, but they are not 100%. We are still seeing only 60 to 70% approval ratio for TRVs under the family reunification. So you do need to provide income, you do need to provide finance, you do need to provide family, and you need to provide a good explanation to say why this person would be motivated to return back to their home country if their PR application is not approved. Uh, so probably pay you know a lot of focus or attention on to drafting out the document in a manner which conveys uh, the reasons of this person's return back to their home country. My CRS is 478. Any hope for more draws soon? I don't anticipate any uh, STEM draw immediately. I mean, of course, uh, the fact that only one, or rather, uh, only two STEM draws have happened, and, and the first one doesn't really count with the 500 ideas. So, given that, there is a possibility that they can always do another one. I am just not very uh, encouraged because they put such a big gap in, in this one. Uh, I, I probably will see a skilled trade draw sooner rather than, uh, I mean, I would probably will, have, you will probably see that one sooner. So I, I do expect a STEM, of course, probably early next year. And with that, 478 is a definite possibility provided uh, the number of invitations. But 478 is a definite possibility with uh, Ontario's tech draw, if you are from IT. For ICT work permit in Canada for 13 months, received ITA, medicals, I have UMI number from India and no IME 
information sheet says non ad for ime will umi number serve the purpose for my application uh, i usually would like to provide the information sheet that you have received from the medical center well you can obviously provide the umi number uh, you can add a so wherever it asks you to upload a uh, medical you can upload a letter of explanation stating i only have the umi number for my medicals completed this is the umi number and if you still need me to do the medicals then please send me a medical request as per the new policy uh, that states that i don't need to complete medicals before at the time of submitting my application so you're covered in both manner if they accept your umi number they will update it if they don't accept it they will send you the medical request so you're fine i got ontario nomination and ita postgraduate work permit is expiring on the 14th of jan am i eligible for any work permit before submitting the pr application i don't have date of birth certificate uh no so you don't get work permit uh authorization or eligibility if you haven't submitted the pr application so if you wish to apply for postgraduate work permit, or if you wish to apply for a bridge open work permit, that is what you can apply. So you have an ITA, which is only the 9th of December. Your application is expiring on the 14th of January. You have more than a month in hand. Submit your PR application. Uh, and after submitting your PR application, immediately apply for bridge open work permit based on the AOR. That is what you will do. As far as date of birth certificate is concerned, you don't need it. There is no requirement in Express Entry to provide date of birth certificate for adults. You need it for children, not for adults. So yeah, you don't need that at all. As far as the West certificate date of birth is correct, uh, incorrect is concerned, you provide an explanation of why that is incorrect. If it is a matter of a couple of days, it should not be a problem. If it is a matter of year, then you provide them ample reason as to why there is that mistake and what you have done to correct it. I will have 492 in April. Is it too late? Mm. My postgraduate work permit expires in February. Also put paid vacation be count towards EE work experience towards CE, I have to take mandatory vacation from my work. I no, I absolutely. I mean, I've been saying 490s will be cleared by February, which basically means any subsequent draws will clear will already be including 490. So I think by April, of course, 490s is a good score and you would be cleared there. Uh, Postgraduate work permit expires only in February. So you have another one year to go. I, I think you're fine. I, I would not be worried if I was in your place. I think you're fine. I wish you all the very best and uh, your paid vacation counts towards your work experience up to two weeks for one year that is what ircc says so if you have taken a longer duration of paid work experience a uh, paid leave then just work those many extra weeks and add that as part of your work experience and you'll be fine i got laid off three weeks before completing two years of work experience but in my profile 25 extra point is already added can i file pr if i get invitation if you haven't completed two years then you haven't completed two years so what you should be looking to do is probably speaking to your employer to let you add those three weeks uh, if you are in canada on a closed work permit then obviously you can't work for any other employer but if you uh, yeah so this is going to be strictly as per ircc discretion if your employer gives you the employment documents in month year and not date then you might get away with it uh, but this is going to be entirely ircc's discretion because they calculate it as 52 weeks per year or 104 weeks for two years of work experience so yeah three weeks short is three weeks short uh, it all depends on how ircc takes a look at it uh sorry no question there gonna quit oh wow there are oh my god there are many questions okay guys please do not do any more super chats i just cannot complete all of them i, I need to rush out in five minutes all right uh 2023 postgraduate work permit extension policy states 2022 extension beneficiaries can also apply can i apply for 23 extension if my original work permit expired in december 21 but my current postgraduate work permit expires in july 24 technically yes if if that eligibility applies to you if that criteria applies to you even if you have an existing work permit which was given to you then you can still apply there is no problem and you should, of course, apply for it before 31st of December. I got ITA under the STEM CRS with offer 535. Can I choose to remove job offer while submitting my application as my score then remains above the cutoff of 485? Yes, you can do that. And there is no problem in doing that as well. As long as after making any changes, your new score remains above the cutoff score for that particular draw, you are good to go. 
Hamam, sorry, there is no question there. AA says, in my EE profile, my Canada work experience shows four year points as per months, but as per dates, there is 30 day gap to complete my four years. Even if I submit IT on the last date, will IRCC reject? Well, if you haven't completed that period of work and you've gotten points for it and you submit your application saying I'm claiming, then it is IRCC's discretion. You will still be short for that period of time. And uh, if IRCC sees that as you having not completed that period of time, because this will be seen as three years and 11 months, not as four years. And if it is not four years, then you shouldn't be getting points for four years. I know the system gives it, but if you are not able to complete that period of work, in my opinion, then there is a huge, huge risk and discretion that IRCC will apply. I'm not saying IRCC will refuse it straight away, but I'm saying that IRCC may choose to re refuse it depending on who the officer is and what the discretion is applied as. I received my ITA last September. I submitted, submitted my application. I have not received any update even on the results R10. Is this normal? What might be the reason? Oh, there is no reason. This is just a backlog. Uh, we are seeing delays of as long as two to two and a half months after submission for the R10 check. So you're absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, once the R10 checks do come through or does come through, then the applications will fly through the whole processing. So don't worry about it. it it's quite normal. It's happening with tons and tons of people. I'm at 481 with electrical engineer not profile eligible for November 10th, but still no ITA after 24 hours. Should I be worrying? I definitely think so. If your profile was eligible on 10th of November and still no IT after 24 hours, I would want to check the NOC code to see where it is indicated. I would want to see the NOC code that you are talking about electrical engineering. If it was for at least six months within the last three years, uh, and there could also be a very big possibility that IRCC has made a mistake with the tiebreaker. Uh, I think it was not 10th of November, it was earlier. Uh, but then again, uh, IRCC has made these mistakes before. Yeah, you can always you can always raise a web form. You can call IRCC and check with them. Uh, I have a feeling the tiebreaker was much earlier, probably closer to June, April, May, June. Uh, but I can't say that for sure. Uh, but yes, check your NOC code to see if it was within the last three years for six months. Other than that, if you are 481, then you should have received it by now uh, because it takes only up to 24 hours to get the ID. Uh, nothing there, nothing Rohini. My postgraduate work permit expires in January. I'll apply for extension to maintain my status. I expect to get ITA in Feb. Can I apply for open bridge work permit then? Yes, absolutely. You can apply for it. But once you get the refusal for your uh, fake extension that you will apply to maintain your status, you must stop working. You must stop working until you get a decision on your bridge open work permit. Then you can start working. But the minute you get uh, the decision on your fake extension or on your extension that you will apply to maintain your status, you must stop working. Currently eating, you mean sitting at 458, 2.5 years experience, months left in postgraduate work permit expiring. What are my options? Your options are look for an LMIA. Your options are look for PNP options. Your options are to improve your score from 458 to whatever best you can. Uh, that's it. You can obviously choose to study another program if that helps, but PNP options, employer support, LMIA, French, and improving your IELTS scores if that is an option. Three year Indian experience continued six months remotely during studies in Canada on Indian payroll. Will this impact my PR application? Can I claim full 3.5 years of experience? Well, you can claim 3.5 years. You don't get extra for five for six months it will still be three years of points so three years or 3.5 years the points are the same but you can claim it there is no problem as long as you are working you are paid even remotely that's fine my spouse is doing pg from bc can he move to colleges in ontario and continue second year will that impact his pgp pwp and pg program in ontario uh it all depends what program it is in some programs ontario has a very clear directive that you have stayed in ontario for one year or two year while you're completing your education. For masters, I think they ask for 16 months or something, but please check Ontario's website for the exact criteria for that specific PNP program that you're looking for. It does not impact the postgraduate work permit because you will be providing uh, transcripts and credentials from both the colleges and universities. non ee app in progress, can I apply for EE as well? Yes, if you're eligible, you can apply. If I claim 50 points from my current employer, 
and submit my PR application, what happens to 50 points if my PR application is still pending after expiration of my contract? Uh, you are getting 50 points not for your contract. You are getting 50 points for the job offer that your employer is providing to you, which states that this job offer is valid for one year after you become PR. So your contract expiring has no bearing because that point you are getting is for the job offer. And the job offer must have this clause that this job offer is for an indeterminate period or that this job offer is for a period of 12 months after you become PR. Uh, that is the reason you're getting the points. And therefore, there is no uh, impact of any expiration of contract. Jansi, I'm sorry, there's nothing there. Uh, Div Saib says 495 CRS and CEC, no job, PGWP ends Jan. Options. Uh, options, uh, very difficult. Uh, hopefully, they continue with the draws this month. Uh, probably one or two draws and 495 gets cleared out. Otherwise, just apply for extension, fake extension. Maintain your status. Once you get invited in Jan or Feb, then apply for Bridge Open Work Permit. Uh, you can change your status to a visitor record. Uh, to a visitor, apply for a visitor record. Continue being in Canada. Uh, you will get your uh, 495. Hopefully, worst case by Feb. Worst case. Uh, and then you will be able to apply for your PR. Or, of course, you can go back to your home country and apply from there as a CEC. And once you get approved, then you can come back to Canada. All these options are open to you. Last question. I had eight months of work experience in India, two years in Canada. In order to complete remaining four months, can I do Indian and Canadian job at India? Uh, you can do it in India, but you don't get any points for Canadian job. So in order to get work experience points for Canadian work experience, you have to be in Canada. If you do, if you're working for a Canadian employer outside Canada, that does not give you any additional points. That does not give you Canadian experience class points or, or Canadian work experience points. But can you work from India for a Canadian employer and claim it as foreign work experience? Yes, you can. That is not a problem. I hope that helps. Okay. I know there are so many questions which I haven't been able to answer. And honestly, I would love to answer as many as I can, but there's always that restriction at the time. So by all means, please, at the end of the video, come back to the comment section, post your questions. I will try and answer, respond to as many questions as I can today. And hopefully we'll give you that answers as well. Otherwise, you can obviously join our Facebook group. You can post your questions there. That's a big, big community and people are always helping, very, uh, really helping there. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Instagram. We just hit 50,000. Yay, finally over there. And definitely, definitely, definitely subscribe to the channel because I would absolutely love to see the numbers going up. Hey, even I need some motivation, right? Uh, that's all for me for today. Thank you so much for joining in. Uh, happy holidays. Uh, enjoy this month of December. It's, it's very nice. There has been some good news and some not so good, but primarily everything to look forward to as we move into the next year. So all the best and I shall see you next week at the same point of time.